Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Go On webinar series. My name is Michael Aquafreda and I'm a postdoctoral researcher with the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program and I'll be moderating today's webinar. This webinar series has four sponsoring organizations. First is Go On, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. Second, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Third, the IAEA OAICC, the International Atomic Energy Agency, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center. And last but not least, the IOC UNESCO, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. For those of you who are new to Go On, it is a collaborative international network designed to detect and understand the drivers of ocean acidification and the resulting impacts on marine ecosystems. Go On serves as a platform for acquiring and exchanging data and knowledge that are necessary for optimizing models. And Go On also provides key inputs to communities, industries, governments, and global organizations who are seeking to develop action plans, best practices, mitigation and adaptation strategies to address ocean acidification impacts. Go One is a network of over 860 members from 105 countries, and we are delighted by today's turnout and welcome anyone who isn't currently a member of Go One to please join our community. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen only mode. You are welcome to type any questions you have into the questions box, which can be found at the bottom of the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. We'll be monitoring incoming questions and pose them to our speakers during the question and answer session, which will begin immediately after the presentation. We encourage you to pose your questions and share your insights on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange and on Twitter using the hashtag GoOnWS. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available through the GoOn YouTube channel. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Eric Mortensen is a biogeochemical ge ocean modeler who has studied polar and global ocean uh, carbon. He received his PhD in Arctic Ocean Carbon System Modeling from the University of Victoria in Canada in 2019 and is now a postdoctoral researcher at CSIRO in Hobart, Australia. Eric, you can take it away. Thanks. Now, just have to remind me, how, oh, there we go, show my screen. All right, hopefully you can see my screen in just a minute. Yes, this looks excellent, Eric. Go right ahead. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, my name is Eric Mortensen, um, and I'm going to be talking about the regional changes in Southern Ocean biogeochemistry due to projected carbon uptake. I work at CSIRO, um, and I didn't uh, list the co-authors or collaborators for this talk because I wanted to take uh, responsibility for all the mistakes and attribute them to all the, the helpful work. I, I work with Andrew Linton, Tom Troll, Elizabeth Shadwick, uh, Zhubin Zhang, and Matt Chamberlain on this work, as well as the previous work that is in the process of publication now, or re review. So moving on uh, to speak about the Southern Ocean, um, just a quick time uh, outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, this talk is generally divided into two parts. The first part is going to focus on the first half of the century, which I think is going to be more applicable uh, to the observational community. And the second half is moving further into the future towards the second half of the century. Um, but I hope it will also be applicable in that we'll be talking about um, mechanisms for the, the unexpected changes that are happening to the carbon system by the latter half of the century. So. I'm going to start with an intro of, of the Southern Ocean Carbon System, um, talking again about the model work, um, and then move into the present state showing um, observationally based and model based uh, um, fields of the Southern Ocean sea surface pH and omega aragonite, as well as to the changes over the first half of the century, moving into the second half of the century showing uh, the further changes uh, and try to describe how those changes are related to CO2 uptake and dynamic processes, as well as chemical processes in the form of the buffering capacity of the sea surface. And finally, just wrapping things up. So to start with, uh, we know that the sea surface has, pH has been changing over the industrial era. 
or the anthropogenic area era. Um, we've seen sea surface changes uh, uh, as, as shown in this figure from Jang et al. from 2019, where we see um, intensified or amplified uh, changes in the high latitudes. Uh, I'm gonna be focusing on the Southern high latitudes. Uh, the Southern Ocean exhibits some interesting um, uh, physical characteristics and dynamics. Um, there's a high and intensifying eddy kinetic activity that occurs throughout the Southern Oceans. There's a connectivity to the deep ocean through ventilation of deep waters coming to the surface, as well as deep water formation in, into the deep as Antarctic bottom water and circumpolar deep water. There's strong meridional gradients along the surface uh, uh, in both physical and biogeochemical processes, especially across the, the fronts of the Antarctic circumpolar current. And there's projected strengthening of the circumpolar westerlies, uh, westerly winds, as well as associated uh, Antarctic circumpolar current transport. So um, I'm trying to tailor this talk so, uh, as you know that I'm a modeler, um, but I'm trying to tailor this talk so that it could be useful between observationalists and modelers together. Um, and this figure to the right is from Steiner et al. It shows a penguin and a polar bear discussing things as 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 a modeler and an observationalist and purposefully they are two animals from two different polar habitats um, to represent the fact that modelers and observationalists uh, do not necessarily occupy the same space so just to list a few ways that observations and models can help each other observations can be used as tools for models in the form of helping with the initialization of the models, with the empirical basis for assumptions in models, for calibration of parameterizations, and assessing and constraining model results. On the flip side, models are useful to observations in that um, they can fill in the gaps where uh, observations are incomplete and sparse, especially in regions where uh, it's difficult to make observations because, because for, for example, in polar regions where it's difficult to get there, very expensive to get there, and, and um, based on the time of year, it might be quite difficult to do things in, in winter, for example. Um, we can identify regions and times of interest and predict future direction of observational trends. So introducing the model that I'm working with, it's called OFM3, or the Ocean Forecasting Australia Model Version 3. It's based on, well, I won't get into the model too much, but it's a high resolution model. Uh, um, non, it use, uses a 0.1 degree resolution, which can capture mesoscale processes. It incorporates biogeochemistry through a simplified ecosystem that includes two nutrients, phosphate and iron, as well as a phytoplankton group, a zooplankton group, and a detrital group. It also um, includes a carbonate system through the inclusion of two conserved carbon quantities, DIC or dissolved inorganic carbon, as well as total alkalinity. The biogeochemical fields were initialized with GLODAP um, and the atmospheric forcing, uh, uh, the atmosphere, the ocean was forced with an atmosphere based on historical reanalysis up to 2005, where it was split into an RCP 8.5 experiment, which uh, was forced with RCP 8.5 forcing. And this figure is from Oak et al, just comparing um, sea level between the model and observations. So going into an another couple of observations into the biogeochemistry, we have on the left here an observationally based Southern Ocean sea surface pH averaged over the period 2013 to 2017. Um, it's based on biological Southern Ocean state estimate, which uh, you can find more information about that in the reference at the very bottom of this figure by Verdi and Masloff, 2017. And the figure on the right is averaged over the same period for the sea surface from our model. You can see that the color bars are slightly offset um, because the, the pH in Offham is slightly higher than in the observations. But in general, this, the spatial structure is quite similar. Um, with the major exception of the South American Southeast Coast. And I don't know why that is, so I hope there aren't too many questions about that. Uh, I'd like to focus on the entirety of the Southern Ocean folk uh, beyond that uh, specific location uh, for this talk. 
Moving on to the um, omega aragonite of the sea surface. These are again averaged over the same time period, 2013 to 2017. The figure on the left is from BSOCI or Biogeochemical Southern Ocean State Estimate. The figure on the uh, you can see again that the spatial structure is similar. This time the the um, the color bars are over the same same um, same spans, same limits. Uh, and the dotted line is over the arbitrary con surface contour of 1.5, such that uh, south of that region is generally below 1.4, sorry, 1.4, I think I might have said 1.5, 1.4, and, and north of that is uh, above 1.4. Um, and again, we can see similar spatial patterns, but the model is slightly higher than in observations. Oops. Um, so now I'm going to move on to projections into the future. The pH here uh, in panel A is largely similar to that 2013 to 2017 average. You can see, uh, but I've, I've changed the, the color bar limits such that we can span the first 60 years of the, of the decade. Uh, each of these panels shows a decadal average for the sea surface pH, starting with uh, 2010s, so from 2010 to 2019 in panel A. 2020s and B, C, D, E, and F up to 2060s. And you can see that the um, the pH of the Southern Ocean is largely spatially homogeneous with an accelerating change with time, which I'll show in the next figure, uh, starting with about 8.05-ish uh, by, by the last decade up to around less than 7.9 by the 2060s in these projections. So looking at these projections again, um, uh, over the uh, similar periods of time, this shows the change in pH over two decadal averages. So the first um, panel, panel A, shows the change between the decadal average for the 2010s and the 2020s, final minus initial. And you can see that the uh, change is accelerating over time. So in the 2010s to 2010s, generally the the change in pH for the sea surface is around 0.03 over the decade. By the 2040s to 2050s, the change is larger than 0.04 per decade uh, on the pH scale over this time period. And, oh, what's going on? There we go. Moving on to the changes in omega aragonite over the, set, over the first half of the century. Um, again, these are the decadal averages from the 2010s to the 2060s. And we have three different contours representing the dotted line representing one point, uh, omega aragonite equal 1.4. The dashed line uh, starting in the 2020s actually, but more pronounced by the 2030s is representing an omega aragonite contour equal to 1.2. And the solid line is equal to 1.0. We can see again a increase in uh, sorry, a decrease in the omega aragonite at the sea surface from the 2010s up to the 2060s with a large area by the 2060s where the omega, the sea surface is undersaturated uh, with um, relative to aragonite uh, over a large area of the Southern Ocean. And this is in line with uh, ore 2005, which predicted that by the 2050, by the middle of this century, there'd be large areas of the sea surface that would be undersaturated uh, with respect to omega aragonite by the end of this, by the middle of this century. And we can also see that there's a pronounced meridional gradient that, that occurs throughout the, throughout the period with uh, lower values poleward and higher values as you get closer to mid latitudes in the equator. Now, if we look at the omega aragonite over the same period with uh, panel A showing the difference between the first decade and the second decade and going on through to panel D showing the difference between the 2040s and 2050s, we can see that the projected changes to decadal mean omega aragonite over the first half of the century intensify um, or speed up and in increase in magnitude as we go forward in time. We can also see that the meridional gradient that we saw in the decadal averages is also apparent for the decadal changes. So there are lower, change, lower changes um, closer to the Antarctic and higher changes uh, or uh, higher 
larger in magnitude changes as you get uh, further towards the mid latitudes. For both pH and omega aragonite, the changes over the first half of the century are what we'd expect. We would accept, expect with uh, the RCP 8.5 scenario where the uh, increase in anthropogenic atmospheric carbon dioxide, uh, that increase uh, accelerates year on year um, through the first through the through the century, and we'd expect to see uh, carbon parameters, carbon carbon ocean carbon system sea surface parameters uh, accelerating in their changes uh, in this way over this over this time period. So there's no real surprises so far um, in in the acceleration over the first half of the century. But moving on to the second, uh, oh, oh, to the entire century, here I'm showing the change for bidecadal means. So looking at the 2010s and the difference between the 2010s and the 2030s in figure A, figure B is between the 2030s and 2050s, figure C is the 2050s and 2070s, and figure D is 2070s and 2090s. And no surprise for the first three panels as you change in pH over the two decades, uh, intensifies or the magnitude of the change gets bigger as you go forward in time. However, when you compare the 2050s to 2070s to the panel C and panel D, the 2050s to 2070s and the 2070s to 2090s, we see that the this there's an actual slowdown in the decrease in pH um, um, in the latter two decades versus the previous two decades. So I'm going to try to answer that in the upcoming slides, but before I get there, I'd like to compare the changes in omega aragonite. So similar to the previous slide, we see the rate of change every two decades for the omega aragonite over the century. We can see that similar to pH, the decrease in omega aragonite uh, increases for the first half of the century, but in the latter half of the century, there's a decrease in the rate of change of omega aragonite in the period 2070 to 2090 relative to the period 2050 to 2070. So what's behind this decrease in the rates of change for both pH and omega aragonite in the second half of the century? This is really what I'm going to try to answer through some interesting mechanisms in the second half of the talk. So there's a couple of potential answers that I've come up with. Um, so what are the mechanisms for the interdecadal variability and the trends for carbon system properties, uh, specifically pH and omega aragonite, omega aragonite in the surface waters of the Southern Ocean over the 21st century? And I have a couple of potential answers. One is a dynamic answer and another is a chemical answer. So the first answer has to do with the changes to the meridional overturning circulation in the Southern Ocean and the relation to upwelling and CO2 uptake. Uh, the second one has to do with changes to the Revelle factor the Revelle factor is a quantitative number, a uh, unitless number that is proportional to the inverse of buffering capacity. So a higher Revelle factor indicates an ocean that is weaker at uh, buffering carbon dioxide or uh, with each unit of carbon dioxide going into an ocean of higher Revelle factor, you'd see a larger change in the sea surface PCO2. So to start with, I'm going to introduce the idea of this meridional overturning circulation. Um, what I have here on the right is a figure that's supposed to represent the meridional overturning circulation. And the formulation I have is based on depth. So the meridional overturning circulation, zonally integrated, is dependent on latitude, depth, and time, um, where I zonally integrate over the entire globe, um, say from zero to from yeah from from the dateline all the way around at a given latitude um, and for a given depth uh, oh sorry from the surface down to a given depth so at the surface values that are red show a surface transport northward and values that are blue show a surface transport southwards and as you go down you're integrating from the surface down to lower depths so what you actually and V, uh, I should just mention what all the variables are. V indicates meridional velocity or north-south velocity. X represents, I have those backwards. X represents latitude, Y represents longitude, and Z or Z represents depth. Um, and what you actually see when you look at this 
picture or what, what you should take away from this is that the closed contours in red indicate a counterclockwise motion. So if we were to draw arrows in the Southern Ocean showing what we would expect of vertical uh, and uh, of flow around that red, that big red blob that occurs in the 2010s, 2050s, and 2090s as decadal averages, we would expect to see downwelling north of that blob and upwelling south of that blob. Or as another way of saying that is a South Ocean, Southern Ocean overturning cell with upwelling south of 60 degrees south and downwelling north of 40 degrees north and northward transport near the surface. And we won't worry about at depth. Um, and what I'm going to show in the next figure um, is the changes over two decadal over decadal averages of shown for the sea surface for pH and omega aragonite over the century. So this first set of figures, uh, sorry, I don't have labels anymore. Um, the first figure shows the difference in that meridional overturning circulation for the Southern Ocean from 75 South to 30 South between the 2010s and the 2030s. So uh, just to reiterate, um, there's a, there's a, general circulation that's occurring in the Southern Ocean, where uh, south of 60 South, there's a upwelling region and north of 40 South, there's a downwelling region. And we can see that in the 2030s, the 2010s to 2030s, there's an, a slight increase in that uh, circulation. By the 2030s to 2050s, there's a slight decrease. And by the 2050s to the 2070s, there's a marked increase in that circulation that's occurring, especially with upwelling um, south of 60 degrees south. And again, in the 2070s to 2090s, there's again an increase in that circulation pattern, uh, which is represented by these red vertical blobs um, in, these, in, these, in these figures, showing the change in meridional over cir overturning circulation over the 21st century. And what this means is uh, there's an increase of the upwelling of pre-industrial, and I use quotes for that because it's just deep water, um, it's further south of the south of 60 degrees south generally on a zonal integrated perspective that could serve to decrease the rate of decline for pH and omega aragonite. And, this, and as I've mentioned before, the Southern Ocean meridional overturning circulation uh, exhibits an enhancement of the upwelling um, south of 60 degrees south in the second half of the century, of the, of the 21st century. So what does that mean in terms of CO2? We can see this is a little bit too complicated to have a simple statement about what the meridional overturning circulation has to do with this, because it's also convoluted with the fact that the atmospheric PCO2 is increasing um, throughout the region. But I thought it was interesting just to bring this up to, to give an idea of what the uh, state of the Southern Ocean carbon flux is. And I, I'll uh, mention that everywhere in this talk, positive indicates CO2 going into the ocean. When, when I'm talking about positive or negative air-sea CO2 flux, positive means CO2 going into the ocean, negative means CO2 going out of the ocean. And we can see um, in the last decade and in the present decade, um, significant regions of the ocean where there's no no um, no decadal averaged CO2 flux between the atmosphere and the ocean, which is represented by white, as well as regions of outgassing where uh, deep um, water enriched in car carbon dioxide uh, releases CO2 into the atmosphere. But as the, as the um, atmosphere becomes higher and higher in PCO2 over the century, those regions of outgassing um, decrease until you get to the point by the 2090s where if you ignore the southeast coast of South America, the entire ocean is uh, taking up carbon dioxide. The, the entire Southern Ocean is taking up carbon dioxide by the end of the century under, under the business as usual RCP 8.5 scenario, which hopefully we can avoid. So I'm going to look again at the air-sea carbon flux in the same context of the decadal averages over, over two decades um, and the projected changes, of course, of the CO2 uptake over the 21st century on the right. 
as well as a time series of ACC transport below. Now, I'm not going to really get into why, but there's a link between the ACC transport or the, the, the circulation around Antarctica of, of, of the major water flow, of the, the Antarctic circumpolar current, and the strength of the meridional overturning circulation in the Southern Ocean. But, it, but there is a link between the two. And uh, at the bottom here, I have a, a time series of the Antarctic circumpolar current as a volume transport through Drake Passage, which is the, which is the gap between um, the West Antarctic or was between yeah the West Antarctic Peninsula and the southern, southern tip of South America. Um, so you can, there have been observational um, campaigns as well as uh, oftentimes, um, it's an easy place for models to quantify the ACC, is the transport through the Drake Passage, and you can see, over the first half of the century that uh that value is relatively constant at around 144 145 uh 144 um sphere drips over the first half of the century which increases by about uh, i'd say maybe 10 percent by the end of the century um, and we can see that there are indeed increases uh in the um in the uptake and or the decrease in the outgassing of CO2 into the Southern Ocean south of the ACC or it within the ACC uh, that are consistent throughout the century, consistent with an increase in atmospheric PCO2, but it is also in, consistent with an increase in that meridional overturning circulation where you get a upwelling of pre-industrial quote unquote uh, deep waters to the surface and those values and you can see that by the latter half of the century, the um, CO, CO2 uptake of the ocean decreases down to uh, values of zero for the bidecadal differences by the 20, partly that's true for the 2050s to 2070s, but even more true for the 2070s to 2090s. Now, why would that be? That gets into what we call the Ravel factor, which is the inverse of the buffering capacity of the surface oceans. So these waters that are upwell to the surface, they are um, taking up more and more CO2, um, which makes them higher in Revell factor. And as they travel northward uh, towards the downwelling regions, they have less capacity to take up more CO2, which would lead to lower CO2 uptake in the 2070s to 2090s region. And we can see um, this is a this is decadal averages over the first 60 years of the decade um, of Revell factor, which shows that the, the meridional gradient uh, increases as you go further south, and it increases as you go forward in time over the century. And that only gets worse as you move forward and to the end of the century, which it should be here. Yep, oops. Uh, so we see that by the 2090s, the Revell factor is approaching 20, which is is a bad number. It, it basically means that the ocean, it, Southern Ocean is becoming weaker and weaker at taking up more and more CO2 at, at, and uh, only able to take up less and less CO2 by the end of the century. So just to go over this uh, picture of Omega Aragonite and try to describe the competing mechanism, uh, the combined mechanisms for what I think is causing the slowdown in changes to omega aragonite by the end of the century. Um, in panel A, showing the difference between the 2010s and the 2030s, there's a relatively slow increase, uh, a relatively slow change in omega aragonite uh, in, a, as a decrease, and that's due to the increasing atmospheric carbon and irrelevant to the meridional overturning circulation, which doesn't have much change over that time period. Again, for the 2030s to 2050s, the meridional overturning circulation isn't changing much for the Southern Ocean, but the rate accelerates due to the increasing atmospheric carbon. By panel C, the rate is similar to B, despite an increase in atmospheric carbon due to the increase in meridional overturning circulation, which brings um, deep, quote unquote, pre-industrial waters to the surface south of 60 degrees south, which is the 
uh, I didn't say this before, but the, those lowest circles uh, represent 60 degrees south. Um, and let, uh, longitude bands stop at the 60 degrees south circle. Finally, by panel D, the rate of change slows despite the increase in atmospheric carbon potentially due to stronger countering, a stronger countering effect uh, based on the increase in meridional overturning circulation in the Southern Ocean, as well as a high Revell factor, uh, decreasing the ability for the uh, ocean to take up more carbon dioxide. So the conclusions, uh, the first two are from the first half, uh, which uh, basically the model-based sea surface pH and omega aragonite fields match near present day observational data sets, which is great. That means that um, where we're starting from is a reasonable, reasonable field. Um, the carbon system properties for pH and omega aragonite exhibit decadal changes that accelerate over the first half of the 21st century. But those decadal changes for pH and omega aragonite begin to slow down through the second half of the century. Um, and the causes for the slowdown seem to be, um, from what I've shown, but uh, from what I believe, or what seems to be the case from what I've shown, both physical slash dynamic, as well as chemical changes. Um, there are changes to circulation, which increase deep water upwelling south of 60 degrees south, and changes to ocean buffering capacity south of 60 degrees south, which become pretty substantial by the end of the century. And with that, I'd like to say thanks. And if you have any comments or questions, I would be happy to welcome them either here or you can email me after this talk at eric.mortensen at csiro.au. Thanks very much. Eric, thank you so much for that really excellent talk. Uh, I'm gonna take control of the presentation now and um, then we can get to your questions. Okay, so we had a couple questions come in. Um, and at this time, I would just like to, re to remind our audience that you could ask questions by typing them into the questions box. Um, and we have uh, about uh, five minutes of, of time left for, for questions. So uh, this first question, Eric, um, is actually kind of two part. Um, I wonder if you could explain what you meant when you said that DIC and TA were conserved for the um, OFSM and kind of by extension, how did OFAM account for changes in DIC and uh, total alkalinity due to both organic matter production and calcium carbonate production? Yeah, uh, so first off, when I say DIC and TA are conserved, that means um, they're useful parameters to use rather than PCO2 and pH. All four of those are the four, I think everyone in here knows this, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. Those are the four parameters, any two of which will explain the entire system if you know the physical things like temperature, salinity, et cetera. The thing that uh, like about the uh, so we had some technical issues right there. I'm going to turn off my webcam and hopefully that will help. Reproduction. Um, uh, has a uptake of phosphate and through a redfield ratio there's there's a associated uptake of carbon um, and yeah uh, and the model uh, represents uh, calcium carbonate as generally it's parameterized as eight percent of the primary uh, of the carbon exchange due to primary production of course there's detritus as well which is remineralized and that has an effect on DIC and TA as well. Great. Um, so I just had to turn my camera off because it seems like I had some technical issues, but I think the audience uh, heard all of your responses uh, loud and clear. So um, we'll move on to our next question, which was, was there a particular reason why you chose 1.4 as a threshold for um, the omega aragonite 
Yeah, it's totally arbitrary. Uh, I picked that because it looked like a good place in the Southern Ocean for the 20, 2010s as a, as a region. It's it's kind of at the 60-ish or 50-ish degree latitude. So it was, I, I, if, um, if that had been where 1.5 was, I would have picked 1.5. It was totally arbitrary. Okay, great, thanks. And then uh, this last question is um, perhaps a little bit unfair because I'm going to ask you to kind of move outside your modeling comfort zone, but in the spirit of your cartoon earlier about uh, modelers and non-modelers meeting each other in the middle, um, I wonder if mm -hmm. you could talk a little bit about what some of the ecological ramifications are for marine life in Antarctica um, if these changes were to occur. I think um, that kind of gets to one of the weakest points of this presentation is I'm looking at decadal averages, um, or even if you were to go down to annual averages, it, it, it's a problem uh, because really where where biology is concerned is where, where it exists in time and space. Generally, um, closer to the coast is where biology occurs in the Southern Oceans, uh, in the, in, further south, so south of 60 degrees south, there's a lot, well, uh, that's not necessarily the case, but what is more so the case is that generally in summer is when um, biology is more present. And that's a time where um, these decadal averages and annual averages will be less pronounced because of the effects of biology. So uh, generally, as time goes forward and you get to regions where uh, annual or decadal averages are below one in terms of omega aragonite, um, um, carbonate species will be, carbonate, carboniferous species will be um, uh, struggling more, but as I believe I've read it somewhere, they're not so common further south as well. So, um, yeah, it, it won't be too significant of a factor for for the Southern Oceans because further south there aren't that many carbon dependent species, as I understand it. Okay, thanks for uh, for moving, you know, talking a little bit outside your comfort zone. <laughs> um, and then we have one other question that came in. Um, the uh, the audience member asks um, or or says that you mentioned that. Um, some of the attribution of the model has to do with atmospheric PCO2 and um, the, the mock, the Marindianal overturning circulation. Um, but how significant is biological uptake, um, like photosynthesis, and, and how is this affected by the um, RCP 8.5 scenario? Um, so I've done model, I've done model output comparisons between the the changes in air sea CO2 exchange over the century compared to changes in the biological production and uh, not biological production but transport below the uh, below I believe 150 meters or 100 meters depth and uh, in the southern ocean there are some substantial changes to the uh, biology uh, in general for the globe it's not so much the case, but in the Southern Ocean, the changes in atmospheric air sea CO2 exchange and the changes in um, vertical transport out of the mixed layer are comparable. So biology is important in, in this in this process for the Southern Oceans. Okay. So at this time, uh, there's no other questions. So I would just uh, like to ask our audience that um, if you do have other questions, you could post them on the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange. Um, and finally, I'd like to just announce that um, OA Week 2021 is happening on September 13th through September 17th. Um, please save the dates. Um, if you're a member of Go On, you probably already received some emails about this and there'll be more information to come. You could receive updates by going uh, to goon.org and signing up to um, receive updates that way as well. Um, I'd like to thank our speaker one last time for his really wonderful presentation. Eric, thank you so much for being here with us today. And I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us for this edition of the Go On webinar series. Thank you all and we'll see you next time.
Thanks.